Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the fourth and uh, final lecture of Franklin Hollander's course on Metastability. Um, just a quick announcement of what's happening next week. So there's a uh, change in direction for a bit towards spin glass models, and there's also uh, an increase in intensity. Uh, this starts with the fact that there are two courses now scheduled for uh, next week. Uh, Akash Jagannath uh, will be giving a brief introduction to mean field spin glass. And this is uh, scheduled starting on Monday at the same time. He'll be giving two one hour lectures with a half hour break. And then he's doing the same thing on Tuesday, two one hour lectures with a half hour break starting at the same time. Um, Amin uh, Kojo Len is giving uh, three one hour lectures on disordered systems and random graphs. So uh, this uh, will be Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, starting at the usual time uh, on Wednesday. You should look at the schedule uh, to get the detailed starting times of his other lectures. Uh, there's also a special lecture by Elrin Subag. There's a uh, special tutorial session on exercises for Akash's course. Uh, so there's quite a bit of activity and you should check the OOPS webpage for the uh, schedule. Okay, today, uh, as usual, we'll have approximately two 30 minute halves. There'll be a opportunity for questions uh, to Frank in between. And of course, uh, you can ask questions on the chat um, at any time. And uh, Elena is here again to uh, help answer those questions in real time. Um, remind you, as before, this lecture is being recorded. It's uh, live streamed on YouTube and through Burr. So if you do not want uh, to appear or to be heard, you should uh, keep your video and uh, microphone off. And at the end, um, we of course um, will be turning off the recording and have a final uh, discussion. Um, there is a recent update, just a couple of slides Frank added to the slides uh, for today. So I think uh, Sarah can put the uh, links for the slides and the exercises on the chat. Um, we are going to try something um, a little different. Uh, Sarah had suggested, so she deserves credit uh, and criticism, of course, for this, is that we're going to have a, um, a course uh, photo uh, photograph after we thank uh, Frank. And this will be done by just asking those who want to appear to turn their videos on, and we'll just have a quick screenshot. So if you stay around for that, that would be great. Um, so Frank has mentioned continuum dynamics on a number of occasions. And uh, that is the subject of uh, today's lecture. In particular, he'll be talking about the Widom uh, Rowlandson model. Hey, Frank. Okay. So I'll yep. turn it over to you. Okay. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, yep. There we go. Okay, and I'll put you this down here. And okay, yeah. <clears throat> so welcome uh, back again, everybody. Um, this is the last of four lectures, and in the previous three lectures, Aileen and I were focusing on metastability for discrete systems, in particular Kawasaki dynamics on lattices and Glauber dynamics on random graphs. And in this last lecture, we're going to talk about metastability for continuum systems. And that's a really different story because as I already alluded to in the introductory lecture, statistical physics has a bit of a problem dealing with continuous systems. And it's been much more successful with discrete systems. And in fact, there's only a handful of continuous systems uh, for which the existence of a phase transition has been proved rigorously, even though there are many more systems of which we are sort of uh, clear about that a phase transition should be occurring, but mathematically they're really uh, difficult. And because metastability is deeply related to phase transitions, because it is, it is uh, a dynamic version of, of a transition going from one phase to another, 
it should come as no surprise that also metastability for continuum systems continues down to today to be a rather serious challenge. And in the lecture today, we're going to focus on one of the models for which we know in the continuum how to uh, prove uh, a phase transition. And this is called the widham rowlinson model. It's, an, it's a model for interacting disks living in the plane. And at the very end of the lecture, I'm going to talk about some possible generalizations away from that planar setting and, and interacting disks. It is also the case that once you go to the continuum, uh, uh, potential theory, which, which has been our main companion in these lectures, is uh, becoming difficult. Uh, when you have uncountable state spaces, well, there's nothing to count anymore. And there are certain things that become uh, harder to deal with. On the other hand, going to the continuum does offer new opportunities. Uh, you will have additional symmetries, uh, just like Brownian motion has certain beautiful symmetries that uh, simple random walk doesn't have. And for instance, isoparametric inequalities tend to be easier in the continuum than, than in the discrete. So going to the, to, to the continuum is not only uh, bringing uh, making things harder. It sometimes in certain angles makes life uh, easier as well. And the project that I'm going to talk about is a project that has been going on uh, with four people, uh, Sabine Janse from Munich, uh, Roman Kotetsky from Warwick and Elena uh, from Bonn. Uh, we have been in this project for quite a while. It's a long, long story. It is a, a difficult and at the same time, very beautiful project on which we have been working since five years. We're first in the process of finishing three papers. There are several more coming on. Uh, recently, uh, uh, Yogesh Dandapani has uh, entered uh, the project too. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that at the, at the very end. So it's been, uh, it's been quite exciting, but also a long and uh, difficult story that uh, brings in uh, a lot of beautiful mathematics, uh, some of it classical, some you know, very recent. And I hope to be able to allude to, to this um, a, a little bit. So today is going to be really a snapshot of, of, a, of a really big project that we're working on uh, to, uh, to tame metastability in, in the continuum. So um, we're going to talk, as I said, about the widham rowlinson model of interacting disks in the plane. And I will define this uh, very precisely a little later on. But uh, before we do that, uh, we, uh, I want to point out that the widham rowlinson model is in some sense a purely geometric model. So it is not so much built on, on, uh, you know, on simple pair or triple or quadruple interactions between uh, particles. It's, it's, uh, it's a model that comes uh, where, where the interaction Hamiltonian has a geometric flavor. Um, and this makes it a little less physical, but it also makes it more amenable to, to a detailed uh, analysis because we'll be taking a great advantage of the specific form of the, of the Wyndham Rowlinson model. And here are pictures of the two gentlemen who introduced this in the late, um, in the late 60s and, uh, and, and gave a little present to, to statistical physics. Because as I said before, uh, this is really one of the few models that, uh, that we know how to deal with in the continuum in statistical physics. And it has a beautiful a structure which I will uh, will uh, try to explain to you. Okay, as with every model, I'll have to set the stage. I have to talk about what is the configuration space, uh, what are the key notations, what is the Hamiltonian, what is a, uh, what is the reference measure, what is the metastable regime, and so that's what I'm going to set up. And we're going to bin, begin by taking the plane and carving out of the plane a torus. And for now, the torus, well, the torus is finite. Uh, we assume that this is large enough and what large enough means uh, depends on uh, what I will be talking about later. So a large torus, which we 
uh, give it periodic boundary conditions in order to make, uh, make it nicer. And the set of configurations that we're going to uh, consider is the set of all finite uh, collections of points that you place in this torus. So uh, here, uh, a, a point configuration is a configuration uh, of points in the torus that is finite and, and uh, n of gamma counts how many points there are. So that's the cardinality of this point set. And I'm using the symbol, symbol uh, gamma rather than the omega because I want to mark that this is really a, a, you know, a very different configuration space than what we have been talking about um, before. And we're going to imagine drawing disks of radius one around the center uh, of these points. So what I get is that I get disks, unit disks in the plane whose center are uh, captured by this finite uh, uh, configuration. And that is our configuration space. The number of disks can be any finite uh, integer starting with zero. So this, the box can also be empty. And that is the set of uh, possible uh, configurations. So that is uh, the first thing. <clears throat> And then we're going to build our Gibbs measure. There is going to be a reference process. And the reference process simply will be here, the Poisson point process with intensity one. And so that is the process where you throw in with intensity one points into your torus and you get a random uh, point set. And that is our reference process. So that is what the disks would be doing if there would be no interaction at all. And then we're going to introduce an interaction Hamiltonian. We're going to say, well, what energy do we assign to a, a specific configuration gamma? And what we do in the Witham Roundson model is you take the union of all the uh, unit disks centered at the points in this uh, point configuration and take the volume of that. And you subtract from that the sum of the volumes of all the unit disks. Now, B is a unit disk, so this volume here is pi. And so what the Hamiltonian is, it is equal to minus the total overlap between the disks. So this is the uh, volume of the union minus the uh, sum of the volumes. And so the difference is minus the total overlap of the disks. And so this Hamiltonian, makes the model attractive. The more I make the disks overlap themselves, the lower the, uh, the energy becomes. So this uh, Hamiltonian favors uh, disks lying on top of each other. Now, a perfect lying on top of each other of all the disks is very unlikely because the reference measure is a Poisson point process. And so it, it happens with probability one that, is, that, that the centers would all be lying on top of each other. So these disks are, are, are always a little bit spread out. Um, and the closer they want to come to each other, the, the less likely that is for the possible point process to happen, but the more likely it is because of the Hamiltonian liking uh, overlap. And so then there is uh, the usual Gibbs factor. There is the inverse temperature in front of it. There is one more ingredient in here is that we are not fixing the number of uh, disks. We allow the number of disks to be uh, random, any non-negative integer. And we're going to weigh the presence of a disk with another parameter Z, which is called the chemical activity. So when you want to bring in a disk, uh, you have to pay a price Z. And that's why uh, this Hamiltonian is called the grand canonical Gibbs measure because it doesn't fix the number of disks. There's an interaction between the disks. There's a reference measure and there is a, uh, uh, a chemical activity. The Z parameter is a way of controlling the density, the typical density of the disks in this Gibbs measure. And then as always, there's a normalizing partition function that turns this into a Gibbs process. So this 
is the widdham Brownson model as it was introduced by these two gentlemen. And it uh, describes uh, an equilibrium distribution of disks. And it turns out that this uh, system has a phase transition in, uh, in, in, uh, depending on the values of zeta and beta, which I will come back to in, um, in a second. So this uh, defines our model and uh, puts us into place. And what we are now going to do is going to introduce a dynamic. So we're going to add to the classical widdham Rawlinson model a dynamics, and we'll do it in such a way that this grand canonical Gibbs measure is the reversible equilibrium of our dynamics. And we're going to do something that is very close to, to the heat path, uh, to, to the um, metropolis dynamics that we did in the previous two lectures, but uh, uh, only slightly differently. I will come to that in a second. I'd like to point out that if the torus would have been the, inf uh, the infinite plane, then we know that there is a phase transition uh, along a certain curve, namely Z is equal to uh, beta times e to the minus pi beta. The pi is just the volume of a, sur of, or, uh, it's just the surface of a single disk. And it is known that there, there is a, if you draw this curve, that starting from a certain value beta critical, uh, there is a phase transition curve in this plane. And it means that if you uh, uh, put your value Z above that plane, you, you crank up the uh, intensity of the disk so much that it, they will tend to sort of uh, form a liquid. And if you are below this line, uh, they will be much less dense and they will form what you might be calling uh, a vapor. And there is a, there's a line in this plane given by this uh, formula, except that it starts at beta critical, where this phase transition occurs. And the proof of this um, was given uh, only a few years after the Wyndham rounds model was introduced in uh, Ruel and Lebowitz and Galavotti. And then um, um, some, some uh, 25 years later, Chase, Chase and Kotetsky uh, revisited this, uh, proved many more things, also made, uh, made a connection with the FK model. So, uh, so in this way, uh, the model really entered uh, square into the world of, uh, of statistical physics and many interesting uh, questions have been dealt with uh, since then. Now, we are going to always sit close to a phase transition when we want to do metastability. And what we're going to do is we are going to place ourselves slightly above this curve, but start the system off in a situation where it is sort of vapor-like. And then we're going to ask ourselves, well, how long is it going to take before starting from a vapor state uh, in a setting where the parameters really want to be, um, want the system to be in a liquid state, how long is it going to take until these disks sort of rain into this torus and turn from a vapor into a liquid? And I have to be much more precise about what that exactly means, but that's what we're going to do. And in fact, we're going to sit just above this line and we're going to go down to the right so it's going to be some kind of um, low temperature and as you will see high density uh, limit because the combination of uh, uh, that curve will force you to, to be in that regime. But we will get there um, as we go along. So this is still the equilibrium setting and there is no a closed form expression known for this critical value, the, no, not even good estimates. So, uh, already here, you see that finding this critical value is not a trivial thing in the continuum. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to mention that the Widdham Rowlandson model also has um, a different interpretation. So I said the Hamiltonian is minus the total overlap of the disk. So you could say, well, wh wh why is that? I mean, isn't that a bit peculiar? So what, what, what does that mean? Well, it's a perfectly nice uh, interaction, Hamiltonian, but it has an interesting other interpretation. Namely, <clears throat> you could start out with the same torus, 
throw in blue and red discs that have radius one half and have a situation where you say, uh, I'm going to uh, have a hard core, core repulsion between the two species and no interaction within a species. So if I would say blues may overlap, no, no effect on the Hamiltonian, uh, reds may overlap, no effect on the Hamiltonian, but there's a hardcore repulsion, blue and red can never over, overlap. So a hardcore gas with no attractive interaction, but only hardcore repulsion. And if you then would uh, draw uh, a, a ball of radius one around these red balls of radius one half, then the hardcore repulsion says the centers of the blue points cannot go into these spheres. And we would call this the halo of this really, really red uh, disk. And it so happens that if you look at the right picture, you close your, you, you put on a pair of glasses that only sees red disks, uh, the blown up red disks, and it doesn't see the blue disks, and you integrate out over the blue disks because you don't see them, then you exactly get the widdham roundson Hamiltonian because the more the red ones overlap, the more space there is for the blue ones to move around in. And so those configurations will be favored because of entropy. And so there's an exercise uh, that we wrote down that you could see that indeed this hardcore simple two species model is, uh, is an equivalent model for, uh, for the widdham roundson uh, model. So there are two ways to actually look at the model. I wanted to mention this, we're not going to use this picture anymore. We'll immediately work with, uh, with the widdham roundson model as it was originally introduced. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, so far I've only been talking about the equilibrium with the Morales model as it was introduced. And now what we want to do is to add a dynamics. We'd like to make, we'd like to have a, a continuous time Markov process on this state space of all these centers and unit uh, disks around them. And we're going to uh, make, we're going to consider a very simple Markov process that allows disks to be born and to die and nothing else. So a disk either enters or leaves, but when it is in the box, it's not moving around. It would be great to also look at uh, a model where the disk would be moving around, but, uh, but we are not uh, capable of dealing with that uh, extra complication. So it's very simple. You look at this disk, you see disk disappearing randomly, you see them being born and, and we are observing what that picture is doing. And we're going to use a metropolis type of dynamics. In fact, we're going to again say, you accept when a particle wants to enter <clears throat> at the position X in an, uh, a current configuration gamma, we're going to see what is the energy if I would have added that particle minus the energy that it had before I added that particle. I'm not going to take the positive part now, but simply the difference. And that's why this is called not metropolis dynamics, but, but heat bath dynamics. And I'm going to accept that birth of a particle at rate e to the minus beta, very similar as we did before. I'm going to, however, put a Z in front of this rate because every particle uh, comes with a with a chemical potential Z. So we want to place that there as well. And we're going to say, well, particles can die at rate one and they do so independent of where they are, uh, independent of uh, whether there are the particles or not. So the, the death uh, of particles is a very simple thing. It's the birth that um, is more difficult and that's when you want to enter a particle, you have to see what effect that has on the um, on the birth. And, and this difference is always non-negative, so it's hard to add a particle because it has to conquer new territory, and that uh, means that the overlap uh, is is uh, is less, and um, and um, that's why it's difficult to bring in particles. For instance, 
throwing in the very first particle is already a hard thing to do because you immediately create a volume that uh, is the volume of a disk. So the first particle has only a rate z e to the minus beta pi to enter, and if beta would be big, that's not easy to do. Okay, so that is our dynamics. <clears throat> and uh, here's the generator, there's a birth, and there's also a death when particles are being removed. And this is the usual uh, <clears throat> notation for, for generators. And what is very important to realize is that this dynamics, as it is chosen here, does have the Widom Rownlesson uh, grand canonical Gibbs measure as its reversible equilibrium. So if this is the way in which particles die or can be born, you will indeed have an equilibrium that is the widom rownlesson model. Okay. Now, <clears throat> remember that we, we, we want to talk about something that uh, involves condensation. And so the way we're going to model this is as follows. I'm going to consider two very special configurations, namely uh, uh, empty box, and this will symbolize the configuration where there is no particle inside the torus. The torus is entirely empty. And a black box, which will denote any configuration such that the disks completely cover the torus. And we want to think as mathematicians of this as a vapor and this as a liquid. And, um, and that's a fair thing to do uh, because really uh, it, it, it describes something that has a really very low density and is something that has a high density. Now we're going to start the dynamics in the empty set. So we're going to in mathematical terms, we're going to prepare the system in a vapor state. We're then going to take a parameter kappa between zero, between one and infinity times the critical curve. So that was the picture that I said before here. We're going to sit somewhere above this curve. So even though we start in a very, very vapor-like state, the system in equilibrium would like to be in a liquid state. And then I'm going to um, um, I'm going to uh, ask how long does it take for the system to actually fill the box? And when it has done that, uh, you, you say, well, I went from a gas state to a liquid state. I have condensated, and uh, and we're asking how long does that take? And we're going to fix kappa any number between one and infinity, we're going to sit uh, a factor kappa above this critical curve, and then we're going to let beta to infinity, and that will be the metastable regime that we're dealing with. So we make a very specific choice of what parameters we want to take. And as you will see, this is a low temperature, high intensity um, limit. And well, I'll show that uh, in a second. So our question will be, in that limit, how long does it take to go from an empty to a full box? And that's our mathematical caricature of condensation. Now, for the particular choice that we're making here, where you say I'm my z is kappa times zc, and I re recall that zc was known in the widom rodinson model, it's beta times e to the minus pi beta by being the, the, sur the, the surface of a single disk. If I substitute this in to the um, uh, grand canonical Gibbs measure, I see that the Gibbs measure keeps its reference measure, which is the Poisson process. The, the Z uh, to the power, the number of particles will become kappa beta to the number of uh, particles in the disk, in the, in the torus. And the volume here, uh, so if I take that factor out, what actually is left then from the Hamiltonian combined with the, the nth power of this term is that really what you get is the volume of 
the halo of this configuration. And let me let me go back to to this picture here. Um, you have a bunch of points. You have unit disks around it. They overlap, and the halo of this configuration, which we call uh, uh, H of gamma, is just the set that is being covered by the disks. And the volume of the halo V gamma is the volume of the covered uh, uh, set by the disks. So in the end, uh, in the particular metastable regime that we're looking at, we find that our grand canonical measure is given by this, where this is the volume of the halo of the, of the disk configuration. This uh, counts the number of uh, disks. And since beta will be coming very large, we're really talking about a very high density uh, regime where many disks in the in the in the in the torus will be favored, and that has to do with the fact that really the system wants to condense. So we're favoring uh, condensation, but we're we're still starting from something that has a very low density. <clears throat> and I'm about to uh, to go to uh, to to the break. Uh, the Dirichlet form, which plays a, a, a very important role, uh, as you, we've seen before, um, in, in because of the, the Dirichlet principle and the Thomson principle, uh, can be written out uh, as follows. It's, uh, there's a test function. I don't call it a, a phi, but an f again to mark that we're in a, living in a different world. There's an integral with respect to the um, Poisson reference measure. There's an integral over where a next particle can land. And then there are these factors here coming from uh, this term here in the um, uh, Gibbs measure. It so happens that you have to evaluate this at gamma plus the extra particle that you add at x. And then there's the square of the difference of your test function. So here's a very explicit uh, Dirichlet form over all point configurations and extra particle the volume of the halo that you have, the number of particles of the halo that you have, some parameters. And this is the quantity that you have to work, uh, work with. And this is a high dimensional integral that we will have to understand in order to make our way to a description of the, the metastable behavior. Because as you know, minimizing the, the Dirichlet form will give you the capacity and the capacity is the key to understanding the metastable cross over time. So that is uh, the setting that we're dealing with. And here again, I'm very, very quickly throwing old formulas at you where you say the capacity is just obtained by minimizing your, uh, your uh, Dirichlet form subject to the right boundary conditions on where you want to start and where you want to end up with. And the mean uh, metastable crossover time is given uh, by a formula that essentially only involves the capacity. And here is something very trivial, which is, uh, uh, th this is some constant, uh, because um, if, if there's no uh, disk around, there's no cardinality, there's no halo, and this is just uh, something very trivial. So it's all about the capacity and it's all about understanding this, uh, this variation of formula. And that's what we are going to do. <clears throat> so <coughs> I'm going to, uh, to stop here. And, and, in a, uh, and after the break, I will tell you what the heuristics is that we uh, expect to happen and then what uh, what the three main theorems are, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what their background is and having a little bit of an outlook on the future. So let's have a break uh, here, Ed. Okay, uh, thanks, Frank. So uh, there was a mini discussion going on about um, whether or not beta C is the critical value for percolation that is infinitely many disk as opposed to a, a uh, complete phase transition. And, no, uh, no, it is not. I mean, it's much more complicated because there's yeah. really interaction between the disks going on. It's not just uh, the, right. the, the threshold for percolation because the disks interact. Right. 
Um, okay, are there uh, questions for Frank before we, we go to a real break, which we will? Yes. So, so in the phase diagram uh, that you had, is it clear that so you have this uh, picture of uh, the critical Z in being unimodal. Yeah. Is this easy to yeah. understand? Uh, well, this is a, you only this... like the liquid and vapor on yeah. one side. Of the... Yeah. Well, actually, it can be understood more easily if you go back to this double picture where you say there would be a, a, a chemical. Uh, a chemical activity for the blue and the red, and then the phase transition occurs when those two chemical uh, activities are the same. And then once you go from this picture where the phase transition is just uh, a line where the two chemical activities are the same, because there's no beta here, because the only interaction is hardcore repulsion. If you then go to this picture here where you integrate out, you see that equality between the uh, chemical potentials boils down to exactly this formula here. So the computation behind that is not easy and it, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not difficult at all. It's very straight, uh, straightforward. The only thing that is difficult is that uh, the phase transition really only happens above a certain critical value. And we have no closed form for, the, for that uh, value. There are some bounds, rough bounds, um, de Reudre has, some uh, bounds on that, but it's not really uh, no no uh, no explicit form yet. Um, so uh, Kemlin asks. He says it's a stupid question, but he wants to know how we interpret the birth and death of a particle in, from physics. Um, that's again no. That's a very good question, and it's again. Uh, related to what I was talking about uh, when I was talking about Kawasaki dynamics, you may think of your torus as really living in a big reservoir. And this reservoir is, uh, has other particles around and, and uh, these particles may move into your box, which is in this case a torus, or move out of it. So the birth and death uh, is something that reflects uh, the presence of a reservoir. Of course, a true reservoir is, is different. I mean, the, the distorus has periodic boundary conditions. We did that for mathematical reasons. And then you would say, well, a particle would sort of migrate into it. So particles are start to move, whereas in your model, we're not making the particles move. We do that because we don't know how to deal for now with the model with the motion. So birth and death is a way of mimicking the presence of a reservoir. And if you want to condensate, these disks have to come from somewhere to, to really uh, do the condensation. So this is a way of modeling the reservoir, but the reservoir is sort of gone. It's replaced by parameters and, uh, and, we, and we've made it even a periodic boundary condition just to make life nicer for, for mathematical reasons. So a good mathematical uh, an honest to good mathematical way of modeling the effect of a reservoir. The Fardad is asking whether it's obvious that the partition function is well defined. It, uh, <clears throat> that is not uh, a problem because we are, we're in a finite um, uh, set this Hamiltonian uh, if you add more and more particles, it's going to really make it small. So indeed, uh, this uh, if, you int if you sum over all possible values of gamma and you start to integrate, this is indeed a finite uh, thing. In fact, this, this partition sum can be, uh, can be computed in, uh, in closed form and it doesn't suffer from any of the problems that it would not, uh, would not exist. But that's because we're dealing with a finite torus. finite volume, which people yeah. were forgetting in the chat. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe we'll take a, a real break, give Frank a, a chance uh, to stretch and the rest of us as well. We'll come back in three to four minutes. Thanks. Yeah. Very good. A question from Omer about the two color model, whether or not you include overlaps there or whether it's just the one parameter. In the two color model, the only 
so that's a model where there's no attraction between the discs. There's on, only hardcore repulsion. repulsion between the red and the blue. So that's a really hardcore gas with no attraction. And if you then close your eyes and you don't see, close, let's say, your right eye, and you don't look at one of the species, what you see that the other species is doing is exactly the William Rounderson model where there's an effective interaction coming from the fact that you integrate out over the other type, over the other species. And it, 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 it exactly produces the William Rounderson model. Okay, there's an ongoing discussion, but I, actually there's a, a rather nice exercise there in Poisson thinning where you can derive the one model from the other and it, it, yeah. it, it proceeds rather uh, cleanly and, and quite nicely. Um, okay, Frank, why don't you start the okay. yep. second part of your course? Of your talk yes. today. Final part of the course. Yeah, thank you. So I want to uh, talk about three um, theorems and be, be, you know, a, a working our way up to these theorems, we should first, uh, you know, step back uh, one second and say, what, what should we be expecting to happen? So we're having a system of particles. They, they have a tendency to stick together. There's this uh, attractive interaction uh, because the more they overlap, the lower the energy is. So I should expect that these particles are going to form some kind of droplet. Well, okay, let's see uh, what that means. Now, inside this droplet, I, uh, particles are distributed according to a Poisson process, because uh, whenever you throw a particle inside a halo, I'm not changing the halo. And, uh, and, and so a particle uh, falling on top of uh, already existing particles is not going to pay any energetic cost. And I know that the uh, chemical activity is kappa beta. So that's a large number because kappa is a fixed number between one and infinity and beta is going to be large. So I'm going to see a droplet that is very dense inside. Many particles are sort of overlapping. Now, near the perimeter of the droplet, particles uh, stick out and they are born at a rate that depends on how much they would stick out if they are being born. Because if you stick out, you're going to increase the halo. That's going to uh, be difficult to do. So uh, particles will uh, try to sort of conquer what is around the critical droplet, but they will have a hard time doing that. At the same time, particles are raining in at a, at a high rate, kappa beta. So they are sort of bombarding this droplet and trying to make it uh, grow. And it turns out that if the droplet uh, has a radius r, roughly, well, there is no such thing as a perfectly round uh, droplet is of overlapping this, but let's, you know, for the sake of argument, do that, then it will turn out that uh, if, if R is small, this droplet has a tendency to shrink. And if R is large, it has a tendency to grow. And how much it likes to grow or not depends on the curvature of the droplet. So the, the, the flatter a droplet is, the easier it is to grow, because if you stick out uh, and you're very flat, uh, you're not sticking out so much. On the other hand, if your droplet is very curved, uh, when you try to stick out uh, a unit disc, it's going to have more surface sticking out. And there's a balance between at what curvature this droplet of roughly radius R has a tendency to grow or to shrink. And we will see that there is a very neat threshold value in this uh, critical regime where that crossover is taking place. And that's kind of the rough thing that you're saying, well, we're looking for some kind of high density, more or less uh, uh, circular droplet. And let's see uh, whether that is true uh, or not. And in fact, I'm now going to come to the three main theorems that, uh, that we prove for this model. And uh, they are theorems that are, uh, you know, very much of a metastability flavor-like. And in order to 
do that, I need to uh, talk about uh, a parameter R, and this is supposed to mean something like a perfect disks of radius R, even though in our model, it's not possible to put unit disk on top of each other so that you get a perfect round disk. But nevertheless, this will be a good approximate argument. And there will be a function of R that is given by the volume minus kappa times the volume of the same ball with one radius less. And the one here comes from the fact that we are talking about unit disks. And if you plot that, it has a shape uh, that is parabolic like this. It, um, it um, achieves a maximum at the value, at the radius that is kappa over kappa minus one. And remember that kappa is a number between one and infinity. So this is a number larger than one and less than infinity. And it, and, and this thing, basically this is the energy. Well, uh, I would say, let's say the free energy of the, of, of a configuration that would, where the unit disc would form something close to a ball of radius R, a disc of radius R. And you see there's a certain threshold uh, where uh, there's the highest value. And if we start with an empty box, we are sort of saying there's no particle. Uh, when I throw in my first particle, which sooner or later has to happen, I, I have a radius uh, one. And so this is, uh, this is sort of the metastable state. And again, if your droplet is uh, is very, very big and starts to basically cover your entire torus. That means that you're going to go down in, in, in energy somewhere around here. And this picture is very reminiscent of, the, of the, the, the barriers that we saw were appearing in, in the Kawasaki dynamics and barriers that were appearing in the Glauber dynamics on random graphs. And again here, this is the uh, sort of the energy of, um, of a droplet of size R. Now, with these simple notations, we can uh, state in first in the picture what actually the critical droplet will be. Um, uh, what will happen is that you draw a disk of radius RC kappa, so that's this uh, uh, explicit radius, and you're trying to uh, throw inside this disk something like kappa beta particles, so order beta particles. And, uh, and what will happen is that the, the boundary of this collection of unit disks is not going to be a perfect disk. It's going to be a little bit bumpy near the boundary. And, and it is that bumpiness that uh, describes the full set of critical droplets that actually form the barrier for the nucleation. And it turns out and that this requires a, a, a much deeper analysis is that of the beta particles that are inside the box, approximately beta to the one third particles are sticking out of the boundary and all the rest is not seeing the boundary at all. They form a kind of reservoir that is there, and it is the boundaries on the part, uh, the, the particles on the boundary, the, which are much less and turn out to be of order beta to the one third, where the action is that tries to, uh, you know, uh, grow the droplet, push it outside, but they're also dying, and there's other particles coming in and trying to push this particle. Uh, you know, outside. And so what is happening is that as long as you have created something that is smaller than this critical disk, your tendency would be to all disappear again and go back to the vapor state. You, you try, uh, and it's very hard to do many times unsuccessfully to create something like this. And once you've managed to create this, then the disk is going to grow and go over the hill. And again, you see here that this the real critical droplet is not simple at all. It's not uh, a perfect disk. It's something that is very bumpy. And this bumpiness uh, represents uh, you know, a, an interesting geometry that you have to really deal with 
in order to get your hands on the metastable crossover time. And in fact, in an early paper, in a physics paper uh, by Stillinger and Weeks, they were trying to describe something like this and they were ignoring all sorts of uh, terms and, and said, well, what should be happening near the boundary is something that you might think of as some kind of wave, a random wave, and they were calling this capillary waves. And, and in essence, this is an, uh, uh, an attempt to, to understand surface tension. Uh, so what we are trying to do here is really building a rigorous mathematical theory for surface tension. What is happening at the interface between an empty region and a full, uh, full region? So here is the first theorem. Um, it is uh, a refinement of what uh, could be called an Arrhenius formula. And it turns out that in order to go from empty to full, you must create this critical droplet. And the time for you to do that will uh, have two terms. There is a term of order beta. Beta goes to infinity. And there's a certain volume term here, and this is computable. It's, it turns out to be a very simple thing. It's simply the, the value here at the top of this, um, of this, uh, uh, this parabola. And then there is a correction, which turns out to be beta to the one third times something. And this term is a surface free energy. So this term arises because there, the, the critical droplet is not a perfect um, uh, disc. It is a bumpy disc. And the bumpiness, uh, there are about beta to one third particles near the boundary. And this bumpiness gives rise to this correction term. So you could think of this as a kind of, uh, just like we were talking before, there's a prefactor in front of a, an exponential term. Well, now the prefactor is a bit more serious. It's e to the beta to the one third, so it's big. And we, we have managed to show that this term is also computable. It is, uh, uh, as a function of kappa, here it is, a very explicit form, times a certain constant. And this constant here is a whole world in itself. Um, in order for us to compute this constant, we have to do lots of uh, work. Uh, there's uh, mesoscopic and microscopic um, problems. And it's going into the nitty gritty of what is happening near the boundary. If a particle sticks out, well, by how much uh, is it sticking out of all the other uh, particles? So what is the effect on the halo? And that uh, depends on all the other particles around it. And so we have to come to grips with what that is. We even have to come to grips with the fact that you say that there are some conditions on the center of this particle for it to be able to stick out of the other particles at all. Otherwise, it's not a boundary particle. So there's a whole uh, beautiful and deep and exciting story behind this constant, which I'm sort of uh, uh, smuggling under the rug here. And the main message is there is a volume contribution and there is a surface contribution and they come with different powers of beta. The power beta to the one third is interesting here. Um, and there are explicit forms for this, uh, this, these functions as a function of, uh, of kappa. Frank, and, uh, Siamak, yeah. there was a discussion that started with the question with Samak about uh, yeah. the power one third. Yeah. Is there a way to understand that at some intuitive level? Yeah, and it has to do, it, uh, at the end, I will come to, to discuss what this would do in, in higher dimensions. If we go to higher dimensions, it will change. And the beta to the one third is, is really a two-dimensional exponent here. And, and it has a lot to do with, uh, you know, when I stick out, how much does that cost? How much uh, is there then that I eat away from the boundary? Uh, and, and, but, but the total boundary is, is fixed. So uh, it comes out of a certain balance, which uh, is, is not 
very simple to explain, but I will show later that this one third is really would change if you go to, uh, to, to other dimensions. So it is specific for the two dimensional setting. It's also specific for the fact that we're dealing with disks. Okay, now uh, you can plot these functions as a function of kappa and, and uh, you see that if kappa gets very large, you're beginning to come very super saturated. So the, the, the time is all going to get shorter because you're, the more super saturated is, the, the quicker you're driven through this critical droplet. But the main message is there's a volume term and a surface term. The volume term is simple and the surface term is very, very deep and very interesting. And it lead, led us to, to many interesting uh, things uh, living in the background. Well, there's a second theorem. Here's an exponential law. I mentioned before, I, I didn't show this uh, for the other models, but the exponential law is a very universal law. You have to prove it. It's not for free. Uh, but uh, this says, uh, if beta goes to infinity, the, the true crossover time divided by its mean is just going to be uh, exponentially distributed. And the reason is, again, very simple. Uh, you, you try to grow a drop, you fail. You go back to the empty box. You try again. And it's and, and the time that you finally go over is exponentially distributed because you have to try many, many times before you succeed. So the gas is very quickly trying to invade this torus, but it's not succeeding until, until it has curated a sufficiently large droplet on which the rest of the particles can rain on and fill the box. So very much what you see uh, in, in condensation phenomenon. And the third theorem is also interesting. Um, I didn't write uh, a theorem like this in the other two cases, but it's also uh, true. Uh, theorem three says, as you go from the empty to the full box, you must move through this critical droplet. So this critical droplet is not just any funny way of condensating, it is the way to condensate. And the way it is formulated, it says you take a ball of a radius a little less or a little more than this RC. And you look at the set of all configurations where the halo is completely contained in the slightly bigger ball and completely contains the slightly smaller ball. And this theorem says, if you are on your way from empty to full, so if you know that you have left empty and you will never come back, then with probability tending to one, you must hit this set before you have achieved your full condensation. So this critical droplet really is your gateway to the nucleation. There is no, yeah, of course you could fill your box uh, by, uh, you know, by, by row by row, but that is not going to happen. That's too unlikely. And in fact, we can make this little perturbation of the sphere very small. Uh, it can go to zero as long as it doesn't go to zero like one over square root of beta. And uh, so we have a very uh, precise description of what you must go through when you want to condensate. So these three theorems together tell you how long does it take the law is, uh, is exponential, and here is your critical droplet. You must go through it. It's the, the most difficult thing to do, but it's the easiest among all the difficult things to do. So that's what the description uh, really is. Okay, I'm, I'm, um, I'm going to finish in maybe five or 10 minutes. Um, as I said, it, it, uh, the, the proof behind this is a, is a beautiful and long story. In fact, uh, the four of us are currently, and many years have been referring to it as a beautiful nightmare. Uh, there, there are wonderful mathemat mathematical things coming our way, variational principles, um, isoparametric inequalities, some very classical ones, some more recent ones. Uh, in order to understand the leading order term, we need uh, volume, large deviations. We need surface, moderate deviations in order to 
to understand the fluctuations of uh, this boundary uh, and uh, basically what we need to do is to take our Dirichlet form, uh, integrate out over all the particles that are inside. We are then left with a high dimensional integral uh, of particles on the boundary. We need to understand their distribution and their there are lots of constraints. If a particle is not positioned well, it will not be a boundary particle at all. So there are constraints that we have to deal with. There's interactions because where we put the boundary particles will determine what the what the uh, what the weight is in our um, in our Dirichlet form, and we need uh, microscopic descriptions. We need mesoscopic descriptions. We need all sorts of approximations, coarse graining techniques, capacity estimates. It's a beautiful story, but a story that is a very long uh, ride. And uh, um, so there, there, there really is no way in which I could give you, you know, a quick, uh, a quick fix on this. It's, um, uh, but along the way we encounter many things. Sometimes we say jokingly to each other, it seems like you need half of mathematics to, uh, to, to actually deal with this. And more is being added all the time and it's a beautiful story. Um, but we need uh, we need a lot of courage to to actually finish it. So it's very foundational stuff that is going on. Okay, I'd like to uh, throw um, two more slides at you um, to say, well, okay, this was a story about unit disks in uh, in R two. What what's happening when I want to go to d dimensions? I mean, see, Amak already posed the question, where does the beta to the one third come from? Now I'm going to state a formula here, which uh, is for the moment, nothing more than a conjecture. We, we have no idea really how to prove this yet, but we believe that uh, what will happen if you go to D dimensions and you would be using D dimensional unit balls rather than unit disks in two dimensions, that your crossover time would again have a term that is of order beta with uh, a function that is again, well, there was something like pi kappa over kappa minus one, but the kappa is replaced by um, a kappa hat that is a power of kappa. It's the kappa to the power one over d minus one. So if d is two, kappa hat is equal to kappa and we get the old formula back and a is, is pi. And A here would be something simply related to, to the volume of the unit ball. And I didn't even bother to, to, to write that down. And we believe that there would be a correction term that would be beta to the power D minus one. Okay, sorry, this should be divided by D plus one. I'm sorry about that. Um, and if D is equal to two, then that will be giving you the one third. And uh, there will be a, a surface term which apart from some constant, which is probably very deep, will take a very simple form as a function of uh, kappa. Again, first in terms of kappa hat. And if you uh, take the case d is equal to two, then this will kappa hat becomes kappa, this becomes one, this becomes kappa to the minus one third, and you get back the formula as we saw it before. So this is what we believe is the case, but, um, there, there is a dream that one day we will be able to prove this. And with, uh, with Yogesh, we have started to, to think about that. And maybe this part uh, is still doable because it's the leading order term. And here the challenges would be much bigger. But it's nice to see that the scaling in beta and in kappa is going to really be dimension dependent. And we have even asked uh, with Yogesh, and we're, we're at the beginning of starting to brainstorm about this, what would happen uh, if you would replace your unit disks in the plane, for instance, by you know, a nice convex compact set? Maybe this set would require some symmetries, maybe not. Um, can you first of all prove that there is still a phase transition? Yes, in many cases you can. And what would then be the scaling? And it turns out that, again, only conjectural at this level, that 
the, the scaling with beta and kappa, so the various powers that come up, will depend on the shape of the set that you're taking. So if you say I take a ball and then I take an ellipse, nothing much is going to change. But suppose you go and make it a square, something that is not smooth at the boundary, maybe a triangle, then uh, it seems that all these uh, powers of beta and kappa are going to change. So if you qualitatively change the type of set, then you, you in general may and will affect the powers of, um, of beta and kappa. And this is uh, a story that we're, we're sort of trying to understand uh, at this moment very roughly. And there is some hope that, uh, you know, in the long run, we will be able to repeat some of the things in this um, that we have done so uh, much in detail for the planar case. So I conclude by saying, uh, at least for the unit disk planar case, we have obtained a detailed description of uh, major stability for a very particular uh, particle system in the continuum, the Wyndham Rowlandson model, and a very particular dynamics, birth and death and no motion. And we see that there is a volume contribution and there's a surface contribution and especially the surface contribution has a great depth. There's a deep geometry story uh, behind what the critical droplet looks like. And, um, and it's quite a long climb to do, but uh, along the way, there's beautiful mathematical tools that uh, come along the way. And I think uh, uh, it is worth the challenge to, to really try and pinpoint down major stability in, in a continuum interacting particle system. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thanks a lot, Frank. It was uh, uh, another wonderful lecture. So um, Sarah is going to allow us to unmute ourselves. And so the first uh, item of business is to thank uh, a few people. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Sarah, who's been doing all the technical stuff all week. Um, and a very special thanks to, to Elena for, for answering all of our questions um, and um, uh, also her role in this beautiful mathematics. Uh, and then finally, uh, Frank, I thought these were uh, terribly enjoyable and stimulating lectures. So I'm sure people will want to join with me in thanking you for that. Thank you.